If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Okay, we'll open up the public hearing uh, on House Bill 436 and hear from the uh, sponsor stand-in, Representative Emma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Chairman Hunt. Representative Biggie uh, sends her regards. She has the flu, so she's uh, in bed with chicken soup. So I'm here to introduce uh, House Bill 436. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about background about the technology that this bill covers. Uh, this is the Commerce uh, Committee, so it ha must have something to do with commerce, but it also has a lot to do with technology. It's one of my favorite subjects, so I try not to uh, talk your ear off and uh, limit it to three minutes. Um, this bill is in response to a bill that was put in in 2015. Uh, it was House Bill 666. And we feel that that bill, uh, House Bill 666, which added virtual currency to the money transmitter laws, overreached. This is, this is our position uh, by submitting this bill, that currently the regulations have overreached, and we want to we want to peel those back, and and for a very uh, a very good reason. Um, so here I'll get into a little bit of the background. Um, this is a big topic. This is a uh, this is kind of a rabbit hole. If you uh, know anything about cryptocurrency, it's definitely something that you can bury yourself in for days and months and years even, uh, just trying to understand how this all works. Um, you know, we kind of take technology for granted. You know, our cell phones, I, I overheard you guys worrying about <laughs> Siri listening to you when you were talking Alexa. earlier. Alexa. Alexa, okay, Alexa. <laughs> we kind of take technology for granted um, it, because it's such an integral part of our life. Um, and we know that the United States, uh, specifically, we're the center for new technology to be uh, developed. And, you know, for the most part, the rest of the world benefits from our technological forward-thinking uh, savviness um, and you know in the history of technology every once in a while uh, a big idea comes along um, you know the the cell phone the phone itself and then the cell phone the internet um, there, there are big events big uh, innovations that happen um, and the, the technology behind cryptocurrency I believe I strongly believe it is one of those innovations. It has an amazing uh, future possibility. New industries uh, can be built on top of it. Current industries can be modernized based on it. And this isn't just my opinion. This is, a, a, I'll cite some, some notable examples of uh, opinions in a, in a second. Um, but if you accept that as, a, as an assertion, uh, cryptocurrency is kind of the foundation for this technology. Um, and the reason it's the foundation is because it's the, it provides an incentive system for the rest of the technologies to work. It's a free market incentive system. Uh, the units of currency incentivize people to maintain the infrastructure, uh, which is called blockchain. And that infrastructure is, is really what I'm talking about, it has the future potential to um, be utilized in lots of different ways that are even as of yet undiscovered that this foundation is being set. Um, blockchain technology is basically a ledger. It's basically uh, a set of, of entries in a fairly simple database. Uh, and that's not the innovative part of it. The, the innovative part of blockchain technology is that once you write to the blockchain, no one else can change your entry. Not any company, not any government, not any you know billionaire that, that has control. It becomes an immutable record of the truth in a database that is decentralized and literally spread all throughout the world. Copies of this database are spread all throughout the world. So that immutable record is kind of like a truth machine. Actually, uh, it was on the cover of Newsweek about a year ago. They called it the truth machine. Um, and it's something that we haven't really, it hasn't really existed in, in society before. And, and it might sound like a simple concept, but the fact that 
there to be one version of the truth out in the cloud that no one can change uh, enables all kinds of different uh, things to happen. Uh, things like uh, registering ownership of property, you know, registering land deeds um, that, that can't be changed. And, and you know, this applies to first world countries and as well as, as third world countries. If you can think of you know, maybe a, a corrupt regime, uh, the brother-in-law controls the land deed records and uh, you know, it's to reassign them to his best friend. You know? This immutability creates something that we can all count on. Um, and then there's, there's a, even more additional layers on top of that that I, I won't get into because it, it goes pretty far. You know, the, the, uh, it's, think about the early internet you know, before even a modern browser was created. Um, you know, streaming video, all those other additional things were way down the line. And right now the state of blockchain is kind of like a very early internet or DARPAnet. But the thing that incentivizes that immutability is this, what we're talking about here, the, the cryptocurrency. Um, crypto means it's based on cryptography. Um, uh, certain very complex math problems give it the foundation, give it, give it that unchangeability. And when the units trade in the marketplace, it incentivizes the, they're called nodes, all around the world, these co the copies of the ledgers all around the world. It incentivizes people to maintain it and to run it and to compute these, uh, these difficult math problems that are the key to validating the truthfulness of the ledger. So I'll, I'll slow down a little bit. I know I'm kind of going a little, a little fast, but. Okay, <laughs> so, so here's the thing, uh, just, just coming back, reining back into the practicality of it. Um, the, the United States, keep, keep in mind this is a global phenomenon, it's not just New Hampshire, it's not just the United States, it's every nook and cranny of the planet this affects. If, if this has the potential to be such a grand scale innovation on the scale of the internet, and if New Hampshire as a state, if we set out, send out a signal that we're very suspicious of this, we're going to use our regulators to regulate it even though it hasn't fully formed yet, it could have consequences into the future where the innovation, those new jobs and the, the smart people and the entrepreneurs, they skip over New Hampshire and they go other places. Um, and that could be the same for the United States as a country. Uh, you know, these, these entrepreneurs could go to Panama or they could go to the, you know, Estonia or some other friendly place. Because this is, a, this is an internet-based platform. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. So you know, the entrepreneurs are going to go to the friendliest place so that they can develop their businesses. Um, and so that's, that's the, the crux of the argument here is we don't want to overreach with regulation because it could have unintended consequences in the future where those new jobs, those, that, the money that's, that comes into this new industry doesn't come to New Hampshire, it goes other places. And that's a very real fear. Uh, and this, this is a, something that happened in New York. New York prides itself as the financial capital of the world. Uh, and there was a guy named Ben Lewoski, Lewinsky, I think his name is, close enough. Uh, who was a regulator, and he thought he's going to create something called the Bit License, and he created this complicated regulatory framework that other businesses had to comply with. Okay, it's called Bit License. You can Google it, and the the result of that was one company applied for the Bit License. This company was Circle, and it had a lot of investors. This company had like big name investors, and just recently, Circle has decided to get out of the the, the business of blockchain technology. And so, you know, that barrier to entry shut out the financial capital of the world from uh, new companies forming. So I think that's kind of like a, an example of what not to do. Um, I said three minutes. I'll just go in a little, just a couple more anecdotal things. Um, Why don't you tell us what the bill was? Oh, okay. That's a good idea. So the bill, the bill rolls back the, the regulation that was put in. Uh, it exempts virtual currency from money uh, transmission uh, licensing requirements. So if you look at uh, lines two and three, um, I'm sorry, line four, four through eight, it adds this definition. So in, in the RSA currently, there's a set of definitions. 
uh, for, for certain um, concepts that have to do with money transmission. And if this adds uh, 20, Roman numeral 27 there on line six as a definition virtual currency. And then uh, in the exemption section in line nine, it adds that as an exemption. So the idea is to ex uh, protect this new industry from overregulation uh, so that it can develop into what it's going to be. Um, and this is what the federal government is doing. Um, Janet Yell Yellen, who's the chair of the Fed, she made this very statement last week. I can, send, I can send the committee a link to the video where she said that this is a very important technology and they're taking a hands-off approach because they don't know what it's going to be yet. So they're going to, it's a wait and see attitude, which is what we're recommending is a wait and see attitude. Um, if you're familiar with uh, President Trump, uh, you probably heard of him. He he is uh, he is appointing Mick Mulvaney, who was a congressman, to the office to the OMB, which is a very important uh, office in the federal government. And Mick Mulvaney is a an advocate of blockchain technology. He's he's one of the members of the blockchain caucus in D.C. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting his staff up here in Bretton Woods uh, over the summer because there's a blockchain conference. They, they come, the conference comes to New Hampshire because of our history with the monetary system. You know, Bretton Woods, there was a very important decision made in Bretton Woods. And so, you know, we, we have uh, sort of like the honey for this industry because it's related to the, the financial, you know, framework that we all live under. And I think, you know, we want to send out good signals, positive signals, because we don't know exactly what this is going to become. It could, it could be, it, it could possibly be the next internet. That, that sounds like a huge claim, but I'm not the only one saying it. So I'll, I'll stop my testimony there. I can talk, I could drink a beer and talk for three hours about this. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you, Representative Amon, for coming before us today. But just so I can kind of boil this down in a nutshell, you're asking us to, to peel back a little bit because we, we're regulating something right now that we, we don't truly understand, and so we might be kind of killing it in the seed process rather than letting it develop and, and, and get some fresh air before we can actually comprehend what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish with regulation. That's exactly it. I mean, I, I had this analogy in my head, I, I decided not to use it, but I'm going to use it now because you mentioned it. But it's like strangling the baby in the crib, and it's pretty, pretty brutal visualization. But we, we want to be careful not to do that. We don't want to do that. Long, long state policy. Yes, Representative Tell me what harm it is right now in um, leading the bill, leading a law the way it is. What harm is being done to? Um, to virtual currency. currency. I can tell you personally, um, and you know, I this is a, 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 an interest that I have. Um, I was cut off from an account and forced to sell uh, cryptocurrency because of that Bill 666. Uh, there's exchanges on the internet. One of them is called Poloniex, which is, uh, it's kind of like a Forex exchange where you can go, you can trade virtual currency for virtual currency. And again, you gotta keep in mind, those, the currency is the foundation for the blockchain. It's the, it's the market-based incentive system to keep everything running. That's a very key point to, to get your head around. Um, and so they shut out New Hampshire mm -hmm. from uh, trading or accessing the virtual currency because of the bill, six, six, uh, House Bill 666. So, you know, th that's, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's kind of a minor thing. The more important point is we're telling the rest of the world don't come to New Hampshire because we're suspicious of this new thing. And if you think about, you know, you've probably heard of the butterfly effect. Um, the butterfly flaps its wings and, uh, you know, the, it rains in Africa. It, it's, it, I, the, the small things that happen now can have big consequences in the future, especially with technology and how fast it moves. Um, we're talking about, you know, this, this industry is changing by the day, literally. Because uh, some of the smart, smartest people that have to do with uh, fintech, it's financial technology, are, are and you're going to hear from some of them uh, behind me, but um, this is a very fast-moving thing. So small things that happen now, 
small signals that the state sends now can have uh, negative effects in the future. Good question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, can you explain to me the harm that you experienced? It, who is it that forces you to sell the currency? So, the, the business uh, Poloniex, because of the regulation, and there's other, uh, there's other. So, who's Poloniex? Poloniex is a is a forex exchange. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure. I I'm just. I'm saying that the industry is paying attention to New Hampshire sending that signal. That's the point that I'm making, and that that's a real world example. So. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for. Uh, bringing what seems to be simple, um, uh, a very complex uh, issue to us. Um, so I understand that blockchain technology can be used for a number of different things. It's not necessarily just uh, a transmission of currency or something of value, correct? That's correct. I'll, I'll qualify that. Um, this is a, a very key point. Blockchain is kind of like a hyped, you can go to blockchain conferences, and I, I do, I go to these conferences. Went to one in, uh, in Nashville a few months ago. Uh, and it was the healthcare industry is looking at blockchain technology. And what I see there, uh, based on my understanding, I, I'm in, I, I'm a computer programmer, that's what I mean. Um, there's a lot of hype about blockchain. Um, it's basically, the, the hype is it's a glorified database. Um, so if you hear people talking about blockchain, they might not know exactly what they're talking about. In order to have true immutability, which is unchangeable records, you need to have an open and permission, permissionless blockchain. Open and permissionless is what the internet is. You don't have to ask anybody to connect to it. Um, there's no one authority that controls it. Um, you know, a database, you don't have, a, a normal database, you don't have that uh, you don't have those attributes. You, have, you know, there's a central server, and you have to ask permission to access it. With blockchain, it's open to everyone, and everyone can use it, just like the internet is. In order to have that that uh, quality to the system, you need to have a market-based incentive for people to run the nodes that make that happen, and that's what the cryptocurrency does. Follow-up. Further question? Thank you. I understand that that is your uh, perspective on the currency piece of blockchain technology, but my understanding, and it is extremely limited, um, is that there are some uh, industries and businesses that are using blockchain technology to control systems that they manage or that they want to manage within their purview so that this immutable data um, can be trusted in a way that it can't be trusted um, outside of blockchain technology. Is that understanding correct or not? Uh, there's, I know this is getting into the technical weeds, uh, and I'm really just struggling to not do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so trying to get to the currency piece, but I want to have yeah. a sense that we're not, that blockchain technology is more than... It is more than that. Thank you. It is, but the, the, the key point that I'm trying to get across is that the currency is the underpinning for all those other layers to exist. Mm -hmm. So that if you get rid of the a currency that's traded in the open market, then you're left with a database, which we already have, there's nothing special about, there's nothing you know earth shattering about a database. It's the fact that no one can change it because it's distributed among people that don't even know each other, that don't even interact with each other. And that's what the currency facilitates, that the, the disparate, decentralized nature of the, of the blockchain. Thank you. I'm going to follow this logical line a little further. Please. Uh, we, still not we, we can do right. beers at Tanning's later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're talking about um, this piece that is transmitted through this technology as the base as being a currency. It's treated like a currency. It's treated like a currency. It's virtual, though. It's, you know, it doesn't exist, actually. So then, why is it that it should be overseen or regulated 
in a way that's different from currency. You're saying because it's not a state sponsored currency. It's like a it's currency. If you're talking well, like about tokens and currency, currency, then why isn't it currency? Is I, I didn't give it that name. It, I probably would have given it a different name, but that's that's the. You uh, used it in your initial test. It's or just if it doesn't have uh, here, have the, the backing of the U.S. government in terms of legal tender, you know. So right. I mean, if you're, it's, it's called for there are no denominations. There's no every, every, there's no every, 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 every block is different. Every block has got a unique character. You know, Number two. This is an, an amazing challenge. So it's like every, every bill is, a, is out there. This is probably the most interesting bill, I think, in the state house right now, in my opinion. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're all nodding off. <laughs> 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 but just quickly, just so I understand this. You're, you're, are you saying that the, the, the virtual currency, all right, we'll just use that word, that's what's here. That's the basis for the incentivization for the, the nodes to participate in this, is that, is that? Exactly, so a, a node is a server or a computer somewhere that's, you know, it could be in China, it could be in uh, Iceland, it could be, and there's, they're all over the planet. But to run a computer, to do the, com the computing that's required, it takes electricity, it takes hardware that, that go, needs to be upgraded. So it, there has to be a financial incentive to the person running the node participating in the system so that the whole thing can exist. That, that's the key. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you very much for coming in this afternoon. Um, so I, I just want to sort of step back a little bit from the blockchain and, and try to get a better understanding of what makes you and others so passionate about um, the reason behind virtual currency. So, um, so to do that, I want to um, talk a little bit about well, a couple of things. You know, we had uh, we had a representative. We had we, heard, we had a hearing on a bill earlier uh, this morning uh, where the representative was talking about his passion and interest in gold and silver as being the uh, uh, means of getting paid and and uh, and, uh, and transactions. Um, and you know, I can go back to you know my days in high school and college when. And uh, you know you start you're earning a little bit of money and you've got uh, some twenty dollar bills and wow I can I can you know go out and, and buy some things and then you get a credit card and that makes it even easier to uh, to buy things take somebody out for dinner things like that you don't have to carry all the cash uh, around you know it was pretty exciting for me first time I got a credit card so so the question I don't know what I was excited about. <laughs> So now I want to now I want to go like what wait, where where does where does the passion for virtual currency I, extend beyond? I hate to do this to me because I, I kind of was going to let this go and let this kind of free flow, but um, I think I think we need to stay a little more focused here. Okay, so let's just talk about what this bill did and why they want to undo it. Okay, and I understand that you want to learn more about this. But I think you can read about Google it, read about it. Right. But so having, yeah, I, 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 he's I'm, done his great job of showing how he cares very much about it and like that. But, but it really is getting us off track to what the bill is about. And we could literally, you know, spend a long time. As a matter of fact, you, you see the guy filming. He did. We had two sessions of it. So if you want four hours. <laughs> on the hearings. He's got it all recorded. You can go up and look at it and learn all kinds of good stuff. But that's that's not that's a Mr. Session. Chair, I'm Representative Bluno's constituent and I, I will I will do beers as long as you want and talk about this stuff. I'm even worse than you. Yeah. He, 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 you got it. Right down the road, please. I think you want to stay a little focused. So I'll withdraw. This is business. So there's people behind me that want to testify. I I've yeah. monopolized enough of your time. Well, I, I think it's great. Colonel, do you have something to drill? Yes, so, I have a simple specific question. Something simple for him. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for coming to speak to us. I like money. Um, the, <laughs> you, you talk about uh, virtual currency, cryptocurrency, as if everything goes very smoothly, but in fact there have been a number of, of bumps in the road, a bunch of issues. Sure. Um, the Mt. Gox, I mean, if we talk about Bitcoin specifically, which is the, what everybody knows, most people know for cryptocurrency, it's certainly the most popular. Uh, and Mt. Gox was the more or less the first exchange 
handled about 70% of the transactions. Mongox collapsed. Uh, that was there was, four or there five was, years ago, right? There was uh, evidence of a hack uh, where somebody maybe was able to, to break the, the cryptography. I mean, it's hard to say exactly what happened to Mt. Gox, but uh, uh, the Silk Road is another example where a cryptocurrency was used to, to buy uh, uh, illegal uh, substances, drugs, and other things. So I would, I would take issue with your definition of, of, of this as a baby. It's really an unruly child. And it doesn't, <laughs> and doesn't the unruly child need a little bit of supervision? And, and this is all that this bill calls for. Let's put a dog color. You bring up, you bring up valid points. Um, and this, again, we could go down this rabbit hole. I could address every one of your issues. I think some of them were in the testimony that Chairman Hung is, uh, is referencing. The, the key thing is that the blockchain has never been cracked. It's only uh, custodial. Mt. Gox was a custodian of other people's currency, and it was uh, Mt. Gox stands for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. It was a it was a trading card <laughs> website that they hacked together to make it, and it was many years ago at this point. I mean, the technology years ago was a long time ago, and the the technology is improving uh, the custodial ownership and the platforms that are holding other people's currency have improved, um, and unfortunately. That's kind of the nature of the world we live in. Like, you might get a virus on your computer someday, and then you get a patch to fix the virus. Like, it's an ongoing, um, you know, threat and response. That's what makes technology better over over time. So there's been some iterations and improvements since Mount Gox, but um, you know. But there's se second level effects, and that's there's second level effects. You, you need some supervision to protect against those second level effects. Right, and I, I would say to the, uh, the, the use of currency, the Silk Road example, a couple things about that. Uh, US cash is used all the time. I mean, that if you wanted to say, you know, we should outlaw cash because, or we should, you know, because it's used for bad things. Um, you know, it, it's, you, the technology doesn't have morality. It's, it's, it is a, you know, a thing. So, um, and uh, there's one other point that slipped my mind. Uh, Oh, in, in the Silk Road investigation, uh, there's something called blockchain forensics. So they can look in the blockchain and sort of uncover who did what and who passed on what, what to when. And that was helpful in catching criminals in the Silk Road case. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were DEA agents that went rogue and stole a bunch of Bitcoin. In that, it, it, like, government officials stole millions of dollars in Bitcoin and they were uncovered through blockchain forensics. So, there, there's tools in place to uh, keep the baby less ruly. Why you need supervision? Okay. Okay. Representative Abel, that's Thank you. quick and easy. Yes, question. well, I, I hope it's easy. Um, the analysis here tells us that this bill exempts persons using virtual currency from registering as money transmitters. Um, if someone is using this technology to transmit money, and no matter what currency or cryptocurrency there is, then why should they be exempted because of the technology they're using? Um, I, I really cannot see where we where we get from your point to that point. Are you asking me a question? Or just I'm asking you a question to explain to me why. <laughs> what, what, to explain to me why uh, someone whose purpose is to transmit currency should not, and happens to use this technology, should not register like everyone else who uses any other technology for, for transferring money. So, um, are you familiar with the term, this is a term that regulators use, it's called regulatory hubris. Uh, and I'll rhetorically ask you that question. Regulatory hubris is overreach, and that regulation <laughs> can have a stifling effect on the economy, on innovation and growth. And so, you know, regulation is not always a good thing, especially if it's a technology that isn't fully formed, that it actually could stunt the growth. But you aren't answering my question. So I, 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 I can uh, send you if, you, if you have a smartphone on you, okay? This is a hypothetical question. You can download an app. It's called a wallet. You can download it from the iTunes store or the Apple store. Or the, 
Android store. I can, st I can send you $1,000 from my phone to your phone right now, based on the blocking, and you could get fixed, physically give me the cash for it. We can make that exchange as two human beings that are voluntarily exchanging. Yeah, right. um, and that can happen you know, no matter how old you are or where you are in the state. So uh, should that be regulated or can it even be regulated? We're talking about somebody who is a third party person who then uh, is the person who transmits the money for another. The person to person transaction is not regular. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, okay. we have the study committee, and what I was trying to get my arms around, if I didn't understand it, was that when we talk about money transfers, the most famous is being Western Union. And I would venture to say that uh, Walmart actually does better. I, I, I had bad luck with Western Union in terms of asking the question. But Walmart is great. You just walk into a Walmart, you give them some money, and they'll wire that money to another Walmart anywhere in the world, and instantly that other person can get the money. So that's what we mean by money transmitters. The issue here was that clearly blockchain, you are transmitting block, you know, from one peer to peer. So we're not trying to attempt, the, the banking department doesn't really want to regulate those necessarily peer to peer transactions. What they care about is if you walk into one of these places with cash, okay, with our, our currency that we know, we understand, mm -hmm. and ask someone to, trend, to take that currency and turn it into Bitcoin or, Bit or some, some blockchain. Now, all of a sudden, you were doing a transit, so, so you can say this, if I go into a bank and I deposit money into the bank, or I'm going to put it in my account, I kind of like to hope to know that that bank or that entity who's taking my money um, is going to be responsible and is not going to suddenly disappear tomorrow or be lost, fall off the face of the earth, or that, that the transaction that I occurred, that the little piece of paper they gave me to document my block is real. And that's what the banking department was attempting to regulate. The interesting part about this was that some of these blockchain entities actually do want it to be regulated. They did want it because it gives them credibility. It gives them safe and soundness and security to the consumers. But there are plenty who think that this is not appropriate and this is an overreach for the banking department and hence this piece of legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now, after I, I was kind of hoping I could wait till the banking department to give you the same story that I just gave you, but, but I'll pull them up now so that they can help, uh, fill in the blanks that I might have created or help they can tell you how good I did of describing all of this to you. So this is Amelia uh, Fioretti, who is our legal counsel, and Marianne, who so I will call it she's the, it's the cryptography guru yes. for, the, for the banking Wow, department. okay. I would also call her that for the record. Um, <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Amelia Galdieri. I'm legal counsel at the banking department. With me is Miriam Torben DeFosis. She's a hearings examiner at the banking department. I can give you the 30,000 foot talk about all of this, and she can give you the on the ground, like, really detailed <laughs> talk. So we're going to start with mine and then if you guys have questions and need that on the ground, we're going to move there. Uh, so, at this time, the banking department doesn't have a position on this bill. We're interested in having clarity in who is regulated and who is exempt. We think that's important for consumers and for the entities that we regulate. Um, we frequently get questions from a lot of entities, actually, that are interested in, interested in finding out whether they need to be licensed by us. We deal with those um, calls all the time. Luckily, when they come into me, I just pass them off to her. Um, but we do get those calls frequently, and there is a, a definite interest in regulation by those entities. Okay, so at this time, under current law, the banking department only regulates money transmitters who transmit virtual currency. We don't regulate individuals who may use virtual currency to purchase goods, services, etc. So much like Representative Hunt said, we're interested in the, the Western Union, so to speak, who transmit virtual currency for other people. We're not even interested in you go into a store and give somebody cash and get back Bitcoin. 
we don't regulate that either. So we truly only regulate it if I, I give my Bitcoin to a third party and then they give it to somebody else for me on my behalf. Um, yeah, and that was the part I was a little fuzzy on because the whole point of the peer-to-peer -peer is you would need to go to someone to do that. So peer-to-peer -peer is, um, for example, no different than buying, and this is what I typically, what I use in the commission, which was Beanie Babies, right? Okay. Beanie Babies, Toy Soldiers, Cabbage Patch Kids, you whatever you want to do. Where is Beanie Babies? Beanie Babies so you, you want to buy a Beanie Baby from someone, that's a direct sale. That's peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no third party involved in that purchase mm -hmm. or sale. You start now getting someone involved in the transaction as the exchange. Now you're talking about two pieces. We have two pieces to the money transmitter definition. We have selling or issuing store value or payment instruments and receiving money for transmission or currency for transmission to another location. Currency can include fiat currency, and then we also have receiving money or uh, receiving currency or monetary value for transmission to another location. Monetary value is where convertible virtual currency sits. And actually, this was the position of the department prior to the addition of convertible virtual currency. The definition of convertible virtual currency was added because of a counter bill around the same time as House Bill 666, which was to the goal was to show that the banking department doesn't regulate all virtual currency. And by all virtual currency, I mean there are virtual currencies that exist only in gaming systems. Second Life, for example. Um, where you have like an avatar or you purchase things in the game. That currency in there can't come out into this world to be used to buy a coffee at Starbucks. Convertible, convertible virtual currency can't. And that's why, just like fiat currency, which is government-backed, convertible virtual currency is treated the same as fiat currency because while we don't regulate your purchase or sale of the Starbucks coffee in exchange for either a dollar bill or 0 .0003 Bitcoin, for example, we would regulate if you're holding it somewhere. So for example, you decide to get an American Express card that's stored value. And there are components in certain gift cards that, not gift cards, but store value cards, payment cards, that we regulate. Just like a wallet that holds convertible virtual currency. Now that wallet can be a hot wallet, or it can be a cold wallet. Cold wallets is usually, it's stored in servers, and it's supposed to be more secure. With respect to a wallet, we don't regulate all wallets. We wouldn't regulate all wallets. So, if I'm going to give Amelia my Bitcoin and it's sitting on her, now it's sitting on her phone and the Bitcoin is sitting on my phone. If I lose my phone, I lose my Bitcoin because of the blockchain, right? The private and the public keys. We're not regulating the blockchain. We're regulating what was built on the blockchain, which is virtual currency. So for example, we wouldn't regulate just the, just the transmission, not the convertible virtual currency itself. So if I transfer that money to Amelia, that's peer to peer. That's on her wallet, from my wallet. That's not what we regulate. Now, if someone else holds the Bitcoin, for example, and then they now proceed to send it to Amelia, yes, that's stored value. No different than an exchange. An exchange has those components. They have the wallet components where you can hold your actual dollar bills to then use to purchase virtual currency, and they exchange it. And that's the other piece of it, then they exchange it. So, so to kind of go back to what I said at the beginning, we're only concerned when a third party yes. is somehow exchanging money or virtual currency on, be on your behalf. Yeah. It's truly to protect New Hampshire consumers. Um, however you design that kind of money transmission aspect with a third party. Correct. But if you walk into a store and want to pay with a little piece of a Bitcoin for something, we don't regulate. We that. don't regulate that. Just like we don't regulate if you want to use a dollar fifty to pay for your coffee or whatever. Um, so that's kind of what we, we were hoping that you would take away from this. Um, we are also we also wanted to um, talk a little bit about how if entities are exempt from our regulation, that means that they are subject to the Consumer Protection Act in New yes. Hampshire. 
Um, <laughs> we think that's an important thing to be aware of. I mean, it's a policy decision for, for you all to make, um, but we wanted to let you know about that. Um, we do have a number of, like I said, we have a number of, we have active applications from entities that are interested. In Polonix, do they ever sign? So Polonix yeah. signed a consent order. Yeah. It's public. It's on um, our website. You we're may have to provide it if you need it. Because <laughs> yeah, last summer they were they were on the edge, but they, they have signed up. So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you, you couldn't talk now? about it. We couldn't talk about it. Right, but we, it was close. It yeah. was close. So we couldn't talk about the details. But um, was it four was it four people? Or yeah, something to that effect. And yeah. we have one other call that's come in as well we can't discuss okay. um, but again it, it's going to be an exchange um, we as far as the consent order is concerned it is public it's on our website um, Poloniex you know has to do a few things and then they can come back and, and reapply there's no <coughs> prohibition for them applying the problem with that concern with Poloniex was it was an exchange it was a, a virtual currency Bitcoin ether exchange and you, you mentioned Silk Road and Mt. Gox. Well, there was another thing that happened rec more recently, and that was the breakdown and the hack on the Ether, which was the GAO, GOA, I can never remember the name. But essentially, someone hacked in, took the Ether, see so ya. Yeah, well, Polonix runs on the Ether as well, and exchanges the Ether. It went dark quite a few times, and because of that, there was a concern that anybody whose account was on, on the Polonix platform would go dark as well, and it would be lost. So Polonix understood that, and they understand they're going to come back at some point. Um, we haven't received an application yet, but oh, okay. but it was truly a consumer protection. It was protection. truly a consumer protection. Um, you know, people were putting their money on Polonix, and yeah. they could not access or their virtual currency on Polonix, and then they couldn't access it because the website would go down. They're putting something on Ether doesn't sound. I don't yet. Yeah. When she said that, I was like, oh my gosh, we might go down another <laughs> rabbit hole here. Um, so we're, we're happy to answer any questions, and we look forward to working with the subcommittee on this. So just, just sort of to bring the whole conversation full circle, and some of you may remember I talked a little about banking exemption from the Consumer Protection Act, which is under uh, the Attorney General's office, which has triple damages, and, you all, and they can, you know, the AG's office steps in and, and enforces it. Um, in this case, you know, in the, in the banking department, insurance department, security, and the PUC have exemptions because they all have their own consumer protection statutes. And so therefore, if you are regulated by the, the department, if, if, then a consumer would go take their complaint to those departments and say, if you had a problem here and you found that, that you're, you can't get your, your, your wallet, your hot, your hot wallet because it's in the ether and it's somehow gone black, mm -hmm. you would come to the banking department and the banking department, um, their job is to task is to help you and they are your consumer protection versus going to um, the Attorney General's office, which I happens to be here only because of the next bill, but uh, but uh, of course that it, it would you have the power to hire a lawyer and go suing them uh, and try to get your triple damages. And again, all wrapped around the concept of consumer protection. Okay, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Um, anybody who listened to Representative Ammon's testimony would recognize how complex this whole situation is, and because I think it's kind of a, still a hobbyist thing, it's it's maybe maybe even a little more complex than it needs to be. But but still, I think the average person would struggle with some of the elements that that he talked about and that you talked about. Um, and, and still, there are starting to be transactions where someone is specifying they will accept uh, payment in virtual currency or maybe even require payment in virtual currency. So if someone who doesn't have that sophistication goes to uh, someone who offers to transmit Bitcoin for them because they don't know how to do it themselves, um, they are exactly the people that you are protecting them. Is that correct? Correct. If you go to some a third party who's going to transmit your virtual currency or Bitcoin on your behalf, that is the person who we're interested in regulating. If you are, if you understand all of this and you you got it down and you can go do it yourself, um, we're we're not interested in that transaction. Just like you wouldn't care if you spent your own money on that transaction. Every, every business model is different, so you know, it just, if they're engaged in that business and there's that third party, then we're going to look mm -hmm. to see if they're doing anything like receiving the currency or monetary value for transmission to another location 
or the second part of the definition, which is they're either issuing or selling payment instruments or store value. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ladies, for coming. Chair will call Jeremy Kaufman, uh, representing the governor, please, to support the bill. Uh, I have. I have written testimony. It's probably not what I'm going to actually say, so no cheating. Uh, and we can just let them awkwardly pull around our representative talk when I test up too many. Uh, here's also my card if you guys want to follow up with me, uh, if any of you would like to contact me to talk about these issues. Um, so yeah, most importantly, what I would, despite the fact that I, I, I do give an opinion in this testimony, uh, most importantly, what I would like to be is a, is a reference for you guys uh, so that you, you guys can understand the technology. It's absolutely, uh, indisputably, very complex stuff. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time learning a lot about it, uh, as well as about how to communicate it in a, in a simple and understandable manner. Uh, and so I'm happy to, at any time, uh, be, help you guys in that way. Um, so I wanted to, to start by saying thank you for having me here today. I appreciate that you guys are all spending your time uh, on behalf of the people and businesses in New Hampshire to, to think about these issues and to, to work on them. Um, a little bit about myself, I am a computer scientist and a serial entrepreneur. Um, my latest company, I moved here to start in New Hampshire uh, because New Hampshire, uh, at least at the time, had a very positive climate uh, for, creating uh, for creating businesses around blockchain technology. Uh, so currently my company employs several people here in New Hampshire. Um, our, our company is founded, uh, I'm sorry, is, is funded by some Boston area VCs, including uh, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Hitchcock from New Hampshire is on our board of directors and is one of our investors. Um, and uh, so, yeah, most importantly, I'd like to be that reference. Um, my belief, along with uh, Representative Evans, uh, is that the innovation of the blockchain will be uh, one of the most significant innovations to happen in the last decade. Um, I like to say that I believe that with my brain, my heart, and my wallet. Uh, so in all ways, I believe that. Um, and uh, so I believe that this is absolutely a good and positive technology for the world. It will uh, increase freedom, it will increase transparency, uh, and it will reduce the cost of doing business in a variety of areas. Um, that is, as long as, well, no, no offense to you guys, I don't think that the success of this technology depends on, on what happens in this room, uh, but what I think what, does, what happens in this room uh, what, what does depend on what happens in this room is whether or not those businesses happen here and grow here or they happen somewhere else. Um, so, and I think the internet is a good example. In, in the 1880s, or in the 1980s, uh, no one would have predicted that the internet is going to be responsible for over $1 trillion of United States GDP and employ six million people directly in the field of information technology. Uh, and I believe that blockchain technology does have that same kind of potential. Um, so I think the real thing that we're talking about is, look, there's, you know, if we accept that there are uh, uh, potential harms that happen absent regulation, which I think is debatable in the first place because the people who are currently involved in this are knowledgeable, understand what they're doing, like this is not, we don't have, I mean, I, I would be curious if there is an example of a single New Hampshire consumer who was actually harmed. I know that we have examples of Mount Gox and examples of the Silk Road, but would this, regu would this regulation prevent any of that from happening? I'm very skeptical that it would, uh, but what it would prevent, um, or what it does cause, is that when I go to blockchain conferences, I hear about, oh, New Hampshire, that's the state that just passed the bill that made virtual currencies illegal. Now, we can debate whether that's an accurate perception of the bill or not, but that is the perception, and that is what I hear. When I tell people that I live in New Hampshire, and I'm headed out to a conference again in a, in a week in San Francisco, I guarantee you that when I say that I'm from New Hampshire, at least some people will know that this happened. This news travels. People that are in the in the community follow this stuff. It was a story. When, when fake news. I, 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 look, I, 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 I'm not disputing that there are miscons a ton of misconceptions. Because yeah, how many other states have passed similar legislation? Quite a lot. And in fact, we mentioned it in the commission. Um, House Bill 666, again, was a cleanup bill. It, it was really served to make this, the chapter 399G look pretty. It added cons convertible virtual currency only, again, to clarify that we didn't regulate gaming, but we had three entities who were licensed prior to HB 666 that were all Bitcoin. Yes. 
So it, it was somewhat fake news that everybody did. We had yes, done something. Yes. When, when, and, and I agree I, that yeah. it was completely and, blown out of proportion. I'm not. I'm not disputing that. And our that. laws are consistent yeah. with other states that have enacted similar but, laws. But, but, that's the, but that's how this stuff works. And, and similarly, if a bill is passed that says, "Hey, New Hampshire, this stuff is explicitly legal." That will generate an incredible amount of positive press in the industry that this is a good place to do business here. I will certainly be shouting about it myself personally, uh, to the best of my ability, that that is the case. Um, and, and right now, and part of the reason that I came here, New Hampshire, I don't know if you guys know this, has the highest per capita usage of virtual currencies of any state in America. Yeah. We have this bill, and we still have the highest per capita. Well, uh, I mean, well, I don't know how it's affected the trends, uh, but that was at least the case uh, prior to this bill. Just uh, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, and and as Representative Evan mentions, we have examples of states like New York that did regulate this stuff fairly onerously, and several businesses did move or close. Um, so, yeah, I, I just would really encourage you guys. I I don't look. I'm not a I'm not a politician, I'm not a bill leader. I, I don't even understand the specifics of, of some of the of law necessarily. Uh, but what I do understand is that these are the perceptions and that you know the more you can explicitly say it's legal, come to it here, I think that the better that is uh, for, for the state uh, and, and for jobs here. Um, and I think that that's pretty much um, all, all that I have. Oh, I did want to also mention that, like, so part of the issue, it's about to give me an example of my company. Um, my company uses a blockchain to facilitate the distribution of digital content. And so our blockchain acts as a register, a catalog, a database, whatever you want to call it, kind of like YouTube. There's a list of stuff that you can go and watch. And you can use our tokens uh, to um, receive space. And you can use more tokens to get potentially more prominent space. Uh, it, it is very difficult for me to even understand whether it's legal for me to give tokens out to people. Uh, or to sell tokens to people. And my current understanding is that if I do that, I need to get regulated in like 48 different states, and so we just don't do it. It actually, it, I mean, I'm a real life example right here of a business that is hindered by the complications of dealing with this stuff. And we're a small company. We, you know, we have seven people working for this company right now. Um, so to go and deal with the regulations of 48 different, 50 different states is very difficult and very expensive and very complicated. Um, so. I just wanted to give that as an example uh, of the story. If you guys disagree with my story or my positions, please, I would ge I genuinely like to still be a reference and just make sure, I, if you, I'd rather you guys make a decision that I disagreed with having the right facts. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to, to also just be a reference and help you guys get your heads around the technology or what we're actually talking about. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, I would encourage you, and this is not the question, to speak to the women behind you. Um, which isn't going to cost you anything to understand the regulatory requirement to sell those things on your website. Well, it's this, to be clear, I'm here just because I care about this stuff. We're, we're governed by laws, and, and whether New Hampshire changes this bill doesn't really change it for us because there's still 47 other states, right? And my uh, question is um, uh, there's, only, there's two states without money transmitted laws. Um, I, I have a small business, and we were hacked. And uh, the critical data that uh, we need to run our business was encrypted. And in order to get it unencrypted, we had to pay Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, an old part. Um, I don't understand uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And in order to do that transaction, I needed a third party to help translate my money into Bitcoin. Luckily, in the process, I found somebody who could do something different and help us unencrypt our, our data. But I want the protection. Would you believe that I want the protection of knowing that my regulatory agency cares about me enough to trust to help protect my money in that transaction? Uh, I, I, I do believe that. Uh, and it makes sense that you would want to be protected and, and be careful with that transaction. Um, but I don't think that that... I have trouble understanding or seeing what specific problem or case this law is preventing or handling. I mean, to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but like, so Mt. Gox is a classic example, right? 
is, is, is part of this regulation, are, and please don't take this as a suggestion, uh, are, are you guys actually going through and, and performing security audits on every company who's providing services? Or are you just having them fill up? Like, I, I, just, I don't see how re requiring people to register as money transmitters deals with any of the security flaws that can arise in, in dealing in this space. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm confused as to what is, the, as I see it, this problem creates bad perceptions, it creates uncertainty in terms of what's legal or not, and it doesn't prevent any actual harm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for coming to speak to us. I'd like to sort of follow your example, the parallels with the internet. So when the internet first started, it was used by very sophisticated uh, computer folks, computer scientists and others uh, who understood what they were doing. It was complicated. It was uh, very uh, uh, crude technology, really. I mean, there wasn't a lot of you know cool interfaces like there are today. But as it became popular, people who didn't understand it as well wanted to jump in and try that out too. And that's when people moved in and started taking advantage of those people because they weren't as sophisticated. Yeah. Um, I think you could draw a similar set of parallels here that, uh, that uh, virtual currencies, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, whatever you want to call it, um, while, it's, while it's being used only by people who really understand everything that's going on, um, Regulation maybe is less important because they understand what they're doing and they're taking those risks uh, based on, on what they understand. But as it becomes popular or as there's a demand for payment uh, in, in Bitcoin, then these people who don't have that sophistication are coming into the picture and they need some protection. And you're right, it isn't security analysis that's going to happen. It's effectively someone who they can talk to to if they have a problem. So don't you think that as, as, you know, maybe they'll be your customers, certainly there'll be people who are less sophisticated about the problem than you, don't you think they deserve somebody who will stand up for them if they are mistreated the same way millions of people have been mistreated on the internet? A absolutely, and, but as Representative Hunt pointed out, that person exists and they're the Attorney General. Like, we, we already have laws governing fraud and governing the, you know, creation of services that are, are malfeasant or, or defensive fraud you of, of your money, I don't, I am very unclear on what, what potential harm this is, is actually uh, preventing. I mean, uh, Representative Butler, did you have any difficulty identifying a reputable service that you were able to put your money into and pay? You, you Absolutely. It was confusing as hell. And ultimately, um, no one a, said just go on to a, a currency cafe said to me, Go to these people who will help you with your problem, as opposed to they were they were really honorable, um, and they said, "Don't give us your money. Go here, and they'll help you sort out your um, your hack." Um, so that was wonderful. But I, you know, I I did not know how I could make this transaction successful. You can't count on universal honesty. <laughs> I, I would never claim that we could. Um, I, I would claim that, I mean, I think that if you, I mean, look, if even right now, if you just type uh, uh, Bitcoin exchange or how to purchase Bitcoin into Google, I do not think that you're going to end up at a website that has any risk of defunding you. Yeah. Uh, I believe that there may be security concerns. <laughs> We're talking about, you know, just picking, oh, this guy, this this transaction will work just fine for me. Like picking a hotel. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Getting money from an African uh, king. <laughs> well, I've asked the question of, uh, of uh, Jeremy, right? Yes. Mr. Kaufman, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, um, but I, 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 you know, again, I don't really understand a lot of stuff we're trying to figure out. It sounds very interesting. But at the same time, we're kind of like a pioneering phase right now. And I think back to a bill that we dealt with last year, which was like Uber. And Uber is a great example, at least in my opinion, of something that like just kind of outpaced government to the point where by the time government had caught up to what Uber was doing, it was already established such that like we built the framework around the industry that they created. And so I guess, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but what we're kind of being asked to do here is allow us to have some legs to run a little bit so that we actually understand what it is that we're actually trying to regulate. If you could get to a point in time, maybe three, four years down the road, where we're saying, 
oh geez, we don't want to put that into you know banking regulation or money transmission. It's something completely different. And and if we stymie that right now, maybe we're kind of you know, cutting it off before it has a chance to breathe. So yeah, yes, that would that would essentially be my position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Okay, Dennis uh, Goddard is first uh, to go. He appears to have left. Carol Perry, CEO of Liberty Bobby LLC. And let me give a little bit more history on uh, this sort of bill. Two years ago, there was a bill, HB 356, that would have done basically what HB 436 is planning to do. 356 was then changed to create that uh, study commission to look at cryptocurrency. And Chairman Hunt, I do believe hearing you say, if I knew then what I know now, I would not have recommended passing 666. No, I would recommend passing 666, but I like sponsored it. I would not necessarily have included money transfer. Someone should have changed the building. Yeah, that yeah, would have been a joke. And I believe, it was, I believe it was after 666 was passed that uh, 356 was changed to that study commission. And then this bill came out of the study commission. Uh, just a couple of notes that I've taken here. There's been a lot of talk about blockchain, but this bill does not attempt to regulate blockchain or exempt blockchain. The word blockchain does not appear anywhere in this bill. Uh, there was somebody had mentioned the Ethereum DAO thing, uh, DAO standing for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and they claimed that there was a hack on that. It was in point of fact not a hack, the rules of the DAO allowed what happened and someone just you know, took advantage of the rules to take all of the Ethereum that were in there. Uh, representative, I believe it was Williams, had mentioned something to where somebody had hacked into something and demanded Bitcoin. That's something called ransomware and all the regulations in the world, uh, Representative Butler, sorry, I was sitting in the corner and couldn't tell exactly who it was that was speaking, uh, but that's ransomware and all the regulations <laughs> in the world aren't going to prevent illegal things from happening I wasn't any more than they the already are. Thing. I was talking about the transaction. To, to pay your way out of Stand corrected. Uh, sounded to me as though you were you know, trying to say that we need the regulations because ransomware. Uh, there was also a question about why should we treat Bitcoin different from other forms of payment? And I've actually got the wording of 399G3 pulled up. Uh, the provisions of this chapter shall not apply to, first words, any bank, trust company, savings and loan, profit sharing, credit union, thrift company, insurance company, or receivership, which is chartered in this state. So. Banks are not regulated as money transmitters per the standing statute. Uh, it goes on to include any government and also gift cards. So you go to Target, buy a $20 Target gift card, that's not covered under money transmitter laws. Uh, now there are other protections on that, but not covered under money transmitters. Uh, there was also a discussion very briefly mentioned about the uh, New York bit license. Now, what happened in New York was not just if you are a money transmitter dealing with Bitcoin, you have to jump through hoops and hurdles. And I've not read what was actually approved, but I did read the draft uh, regulations, and it was any business that accepts Bitcoin must keep name, address, identifying information of every customer that they deal with if they have any customers in New York. So there were a lot of companies that dealt with Bitcoin and other virtual currencies that they put up on their website, we do not do business with anyone living in the state of New York because then that would have required them to keep all kinds of documentation on every customer they had, whether that customer used Bitcoin or not. And HB 356, two years ago, 
was an attempt to make sure that New Hampshire does not become a state with one of these onerous bit licenses of give us information on every customer you have because somebody used Bitcoin that lived in New Hampshire. And I think that HP 436 is definitely a good start towards allowing people to use Bitcoin and not think that they have to be regulated. Now I do have one minor issue with the wording here in that it leaves in place the term convertible virtual currency and just says that we won't regulate you if you're using virtual currency, which my understanding here seems to say that if you're using Bitcoin because it can be converted to US dollars, we might still want to regulate you. Uh, so the intent here is one thing, but the actual wording is something slightly different. Uh, but I definitely am wholeheartedly in support of the intent, and I will attempt to answer any questions. Well said, thank you. Freeman. Good afternoon, I'm Ian Freeman, uh, McKean, one of the co-chairs of the New Hampshire Liberty Party. I'm also involved in a lot of Bitcoin advocacy and outreach. I've been a Bitcoiner since 2011. Um, big fan of the whole concept. And I share a lot of the concerns that have already been echoed here, although uh, Daryl said it was a minor concern. I would say it's a major concern uh, that the convertible virtual currency would still remain even if this bill were passed. It would seem that the right way to go about this would be to just simply apply this bill to convertible virtual currency where people who are doing business with convertible virtual currency in New Hampshire shouldn't have to worry about the state coming down on them and possibly putting them out of business or driving them away from doing business in New Hampshire in the first place. Um, you know, Chairman Hunt, you mentioned you had trouble, uh, I think you said bad luck, with Western Union. Now, if I'm not mistaken, they are a very highly regulated business. So, isn't the whole point of these money transmitter regulations to make sure that... Uh, I wanted to know, uh, to, to confirm who I was, who I said I was. And they said, did you ever have a checking account in these three states? I don't know, somewhere along the line I, I answered it wrong and then they rejected me. <laughs> so you've been protected right out of doing it business they, with... They, they, they were too secure. Yeah. They so, too secure. You know, maybe it's the government regulations that uh, forced them to no, I think it was their, their, put those into place. So um, it was also mentioned earlier that there are all, a couple of states that don't even have money transmitter regulations whatsoever, which of course I think begs the question of what is the point of any money transmitter regulations. You know, this bill doesn't go far enough, in my opinion. Uh, we ought to have a bill put forward that completely strikes all the money transmitter laws. What is the point of it? Is it to protect people? Because I believe South Carolina is one of those states that doesn't have money transmitter laws. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, are there a bunch of people getting taken advantage of by Western Union there? Are Bitcoin exchange, you know, unscrupulous Bitcoin exchanges uh, taking advantage of people there? Let's let the market decide how to protect consumers rather than looking to government bureaucracies who are inherently not particularly efficient or generally you know, good at doing what they do as best as they try. It seems to me that the money transmitter regulations are more about what government does best, which is to tax it if it moves. What's that? There's money moving from one person to a third party to another person? Well, we ought to get a piece of that, but we'll leave it alone if it's going from one person to another person. That's totally fine, for now at least. Um, and of course we all know that the money transmitter laws, if the excuse is that, well, it's to protect people or to, you know, stop drug dealing or money laundering or whatever the excuse might be, because you know, government guys won't admit that it's just because they want to get a piece of the action. Um, so it's, it's to protect us from drugs. Well, obviously the money transmitter regulations have done nothing to stop uh, drug dealing. That's still going on and most drug dealers are using cash. And, no one is proposing, you know, cash be banned or anything like that. I actually have heard uh, proposals to get rid of all currency 
over $20. And if we only had $10 currencies, we would kill the drug business. They tried that um, by getting rid of $500 and $1,000 in the past. You remember we used to have those bills. And <coughs> $100, they wanted to get rid of $50. Yeah. And that was the excuse back then. And it just means so that the drug dealers... never, because yeah. there is that proposal. It just means the drug dealers have to buy cash counting machines, you know, and, and take a little bit of extra time to... One thing's for sure, um, when there's, we all know that when there's a demand in the marketplace, someone is going to supply that demand. And the same thing's true for, for Bitcoin. Um, if you are going to regulate Bitcoin in New Hampshire, people are going to get their Bitcoin from elsewhere. Those Bitcoin businesses are not going to open up in New Hampshire. New, New Hampshire used to be, not long ago, a beacon for Bitcoiners where, wow, this is like a free place, you know, live free or die. Let's open up a business there. It'd be a great place uh, to do that. And then this, as uh, Jeremy explained earlier, these regulations wasn't the intention, but the understanding of these regulations, the misunderstanding of them, has kept people away and has kept businesses and jobs away from the state. And if I'm recalling correctly, the banking commissioners were asked during the commission, uh, the crypto commission, which all of you weren't necessarily a part of, so I'll bring you briefly up to speed. I believe you asked the question, Chairman Hunt, was, was there ever any complaint whatsoever to the banking administrators here in New Hampshire regarding virtual currency? And the answer was no, that there has never been a single complaint. So again, uh, you know, the cart's way before the horse on this one, and I would support uh, this legislation with the same reservations that Daryl had that it needs to be reworked to make sure that it's clear that anyone doing business with virtual currency is exempted. And further, let's just get rid of the money transmitter regulations. I mean, what's the point? Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No, thank you. Anybody else like to speak on Bill 436? No, we'll go to public hearing. We'll take a five minute break. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.